Twas early in a fine summer's morning as I strolled Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Murder at Mother Mountain, Deep Dive Number 1. While the story of Ellen's life will continue in part two of the main series next week, this episode delves into the history of the period in greater detail. Now, religious records were key to understanding Ellen's early years, and this reflects the importance of religion in general in wider society in the early 19th century in Ireland. However, the Catholic Church, the one that Ellen grew up in, before the famine was radically different to the organisation that would emerge later in the 19th century. In light of this, I was delighted to get to interview Salvador Ryan. Now, Salvador is the Professor of Ecclesiastical History in Maynooth University, and we chatted about the pre-famine Catholic Church in detail to give you a better understanding into early 19th century life in Ireland. Before beginning, I want to flag that this interview itself is a relic of past times. It was done during COVID and was conducted, obviously, then online. The call drops out once in the middle of the interview, but it's a minor inconvenience. To begin, Salvador started by giving me an overview of the pre-famine church Ellen grew up in. If, if, if you were to describe the pre-famine Irish church, in many ways, I suppose it was a church that was still functioning almost like it was in the penal times, or certainly the penal times and the, 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 the um, fallout from the penal times was very much with it still. So, for instance, the, in the pre-famine church, the, it, it really couldn't provide, I suppose, enough priests or religious for its needs. And the population, of course, was rapidly expanding. So, for instance, if you take it, we'll say between 1750 and 1845, the population of Ireland would have risen from about 2.6 million in 1750 to 8.5 million in 1845. And you don't have to be a mathematician to to work out that that would have significant uh, ramifications for pastoral ministry, for instance. The church uh, in Ireland couldn't build enough chapels or churches fast enough to cater for the rising population and the needs of people. And that's coming from, of course, a, 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 a penal period where many of the chapels had either been taken over or fallen into disuse and so on and more chapels had to be built. A lack of adequate chapels has was made it almost impossible for people in some areas to attend mass. Um, In the 1970s, uh, um, one academic, David Miller, had famously estimated that that mass attendance on the eve of the famine was around 40%. Uh, Now, of course, that wasn't right across the board in Ireland. Uh, Numbers were higher for instance, in the eastern half of the country, then you'd find them in the south or the southwest and the west. Um, The transformation, I suppose, in the infrastructure of the church from the 18th to the late 19th century was was phenomenal. If you take it, for instance, in 1752, there were about 832 simple mass houses in Ireland. Now, I suppose they they were little more than thatch sheds, really, with clay floors. Now, contrast that to the late 19th century, where you had at least 24 major cathedrals and more than 3,000 substantial churches which had been built in the interim. When you look at church personnel, for instance, um, here's a startling figure for you. In in the year 1800, there were only about, there were only 122 nuns in Ireland. By 1850, that number had risen to 1,000 nuns. And by 1900, the number stood at around 8,000 nuns. So from 1800, 122 nuns in Ireland, 1900, 8,000. Um, the pre-famine church in Ireland, I suppose, struggled with its priest to people ratio. And that's where, I suppose, the onset of the famine changed things very quickly. Now, in precisely, I suppose, those areas where church infrastructure had been at its most difficult, Uh, where, for instance, clerical supervision of people had been at its weakest. Places like the western and northwestern parts of the country, particularly Irish-speaking parts of the country, there was now an opportunity for clergy to address that imbalance, given uh, the the, the drop in population in those very areas. 
which was famine related, obviously. Uh, these were also the areas which clung most tightly to traditional religious practice and uh, practices which were increasingly regarded, for instance, as superstitious. Um, James Hall, uh, who was touring through Ireland in 1813, he was in the town of Tralee and he recalls how he found a respectable looking man on his knees praying for the repose of the soul of his son. And when the bell tolled, the church bell tolled, the man turned his face towards the church and he, he prayed more fervently. And James Hall, who was traveling through Ireland, he, he said he went up to the man and he said to the man that he was glad, glad to see him so devoutly employed. But then he says, though minutely acquainted with the prayers and forms of Catholic worship, I found that he scarcely knew anything either of the doctrines or the duties of Christianity. So in this pre famine period, you often had, I suppose, a people who were people of prayer rather than a people who were acquainted with, say, with the intricacies of Christian doctrine, if you like. Um, now, by contrast, the same James Hall was going through Carlo, and he met, as he said, he met a tolerably well-dressed, well fat-looking farmer who said that he wouldn't give a farthing to have his children taught anything more than the catechism, that all other knowledge uh, was of no use to them whatsoever. So here was a man in 1813, a, a farmer who obviously thought what, what the catechism had to tell him was, was uh, and what the catechism had to tell his children was very important. Um, the same James Hall was going from, from Limerick to Killaloo in 1813, and he found uh, a man who couldn't read sitting by the wayside counting his rosary. And when he'd gone through the rosary three, three times and said his Our Fathers and Hail Marys, he said he told me that he had counted it 15 times every day for many years and trusted in God that nothing had ever happened which would prevent him from performing such important a duty. And we find even in catechisms of the period, just slightly in the famine period itself, in, in Dublin in, in 1848, Dunleavy's Irish Catechism, for instance, asked the question, to whom are, are the beads of greatest use? And it said, it answered, to those who cannot read or those that are not trained up or used to prayer. You would find rosary beads, for instance, even in the poorest of houses, they'd be, they'd be hanging up on the wall. It was something that, 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 that it was easy to pray, even for those who weren't able to read religious books of instruction, for instance. Now, regular mass attendance is something that became central to religious life in Ireland in the later 19th and 20th centuries. As touched on in episode one, this was not the case for Ellen Kennedy, however. Her home on Keeper Hill was quite far away from the parish church in Newport, so she probably didn't attend Mass on a regular basis. Salvador now explains some of the factors that could influence whether people attended Mass or not. The, the, the American historian Emmett Larkin, who, who, who wrote this famous article in 1972 about the devotional revolution, he used figures uh, that he drew from David Miller, which basically said that, roughly speaking, about 40% of people attended mass on the eve of the famine. And that rose to over 90% by the late 19th century. Um, and Emmett Larkin would say the devotional revolution turned the Irish into what he called practicing Catholics. Now, what he meant by practicing Catholics was church observant Catholics. Now, uh, one temporary historian, Tom McGrath, has sort of uh, argued much later that, that, that what Larkin was doing was mistaking church life for religious life. Uh, just because people didn't get to Mass didn't necessarily mean that they didn't have a religious or devotional life. Um, so, for instance, there were, very, there were a lot of reasons why, uh, why, why people wouldn't go to Mass or didn't get to Mass. So, for instance, the, the, the long distances between their own houses and the, and the church, for instance. You would also get the... the um, um, Another reason why uh, uh, people stayed away from Mass was not from a lack of devotion, but maybe because of the inappropriate clothing that they had. They didn't have good enough clothing to actually go to, 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 to Mass. Um, so that, that, that's certainly true. I, I, I know of um, one account from Killaloo, for instance, in the 19th century, where two sisters, they attended two separate Masses, and they would actually meet halfway between their house and, and, and the church, and they would exchange the one good coat that they had so that the other could go to Mass. Um, 
there are all sorts of reasons why why uh, people didn't go to mass, and certainly, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't necessarily from from a, a lack of devotion. If you look, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things to look at uh, from this period is uh, the accounts of people who who were traveling in Ireland at the time. That's outsiders coming through Ireland, and what their impression of people attending mass was. So, for instance, Henry Inglis toured Ireland in 1830, and he said when he was in Kil- County Kilkenny, he, he went to Thomastown, and uh, he said it was Sunday morning, um, and, uh, uh, sorry, a, a Sunday morning in Thomastown, and he, he said he, he saw the population of this Kilkenny country parish thronging to the Catholic chapel. He says elsewhere he was traveling between the Stoll and Car- Tarbert uh, early one morning, and he said it was Sunday morning, and I observed that the articles of apparel meant to be displayed at mass and which had been washed the night before had been left on the hedges all night. So again, whatever good clothes that people had, the best clothes that they had was put out on the hedges for the, for, for, for the next day. Another writer, George uh, Graham Matheson, uh, visited a chapel in, in a county Kerry town in 1835. And it, here's what he described. He said, he passed to the chapel, he said it was very dirty and very full. In fact, there was not room for numbers and the, and the avenue to a great distance and, uh, and space all around the, the door was covered with poor creatures. Some were kneeling, some were prostrated as in Eastern climes, some were touching the ground with their faces. Others were sitting, others were standing against the wall and begging in the name of God and the Blessed Mother and dealing out blessings on all who passed by. Um, so the impression, at least for, for, for some of these uh, travellers through, through Ireland, is that people thronged the chapels. Now, of course, the chapels oftentimes weren't very big and couldn't hold the number of people who wanted to get in. And they might be out in the yard uh, uh, or you know, around the chapel, not actually being able to get in. Um, so David Miller's statistics aside of 40 percent, the impression many visitors to Ireland received was of a people who frequented the churches that were actually available to them. Class background was also a factor that could determine mass attendance. But as Salvador explains next, in some instances, the priest would travel to remote households. Yeah, certainly, I, certainly attendance at mass uh, and the frequency at, uh, with which people attended mass was very dependent on your own material circumstances. So um, if you had the suitable clothing to attend mass, um, that meant that you, you, you were going to be more inclined to go. Also, your geographical location, where you actually lived, um, how far it was to the mass. So for instance, um, there's an account from 1899 from Ross Muck in, in, in Connemara, uh, where the local priest uh, wrote to his bishop and recounted, you know, how difficult he even found it to travel to say mass in Camus, uh, where which he said was seven miles away. The road was very hilly and it was very bad, especially in wintertime. So even this was the priest actually getting out to an outlying church. The, the same difficulties and more um, faced a lot of, of families living in, a, in, in um, remote regions actually getting to a chapel. Um, Of course, and and the other thing about that, uh, the other thing about um, being suitably attired as well, it it also feeds into this uh, notion of what was appropriate um, when when you actually actually went to chapel, how you might be dressed, how you might might behave when you're in chapel. And it feeds into this increasing emphasis on civility and propriety, uh, certainly in relation to uh, religious observance and also in relation to how a a chapel was decked out, the the vestments that a a priest would wear, the the, um, liturgical vessels that would be used. These often weren't up to scratch. And that's one of the things that that, that something like the Synod of Thurlis and, and these reforming measures put a put a spotlight on what was actually appropriate for the, the fit celebration of the liturgy. So all of these things were were, were, were uh, bound up together. Of course, I suppose the, the insufficiency of church structures was offset, I suppose, in a way 
by the availability of stations in people's houses, the, the, the famous stations where, where, where uh, mass would be said in the house and the priest would go to the house and the neighbours would, 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 uh, would uh, gather together. And I suppose despite nearly all the church synods between 1830 and 1875 largely disapproving of them, uh, the practice of, of, of the station mass has actually died very hard, if you like. Um, we know from you know diaries of priests, a diary of a priest from Kilmore Diocese, for instance, uh, uh, covering the years from 1827 to 1829, reveals that he held 60 stations on average each year. Um, and this was also an opportunity for a priest to catechize. So uh, when he would do the station mass, he would gather, would say children around him, boys and girls, maybe sometimes, you know, in, 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 in maybe in a barn or whatever, he'd sit in a stool in the middle of the floor and he'd question them on, on, on their catechism. Through Ellen's life, numerous religious services that in later decades would take place in church buildings, such as baptisms and marriages, took place in the family home. I asked Salvador about this. So, for instance, you know, it, it, it was often a case of, of, of the priest going to the people rather than the people going to the priest. So if you take, for instance, um, simple things such as the performance of baptism or the performance of or, or, or the celebration of, 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 of marriage, for instance, um, marriages and baptisms tended uh, for, for, for a lot of the, the, the 19th century to take place at home. Um, and even church figures uh, recognized that this was, this was absolutely necessary. Uh, some church figures did. Now, obviously, there was the need for reform. The, 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 the Synod of Perlis and that whole reform movement uh, was trying to relocate these things within, uh, to, to, within their proper uh, church setting, as they would have seen it. But for instance, one bishop uh, just... Uh, around the time of the famine, or just slightly after Bishop Daniel Vaughan of Killaloo. I mean, he, he said that while he was you know, anxious that the sacraments would be administered insofar as possible in the churches, but like he was no fool. He said, like, he said, considering the calamitous circumstances of the times and considering the deplorable condition of the poor people, he said, I will not for the present make it obligatory to have marriages celebrated in the church. So I suppose he was, he, he was very aware of the, the, the realities on the ground. And while all of these um, instructions might, you know, might be, and these desiderata, if you like, might be laid out by, by, by church synods, such as the Synod of Perlis and so on, um, that this, that this, this uh, wasn't always how it would play out on the ground. And it would take a lot of time to put that infrastructure in place. Um, for instance, even in the, about baptism in, in the mid 19th century, when, um, when uh, Bishop John uh, O'Sullivan, the mayor, attempted to, uh, uh, when John O'Sullivan, brother John O'Sullivan in, in Kinmare, attempted to outlaw baptisms in Kinmare homes, um, he excited a great storm in consequence, so much so that actually for a long time afterwards, the people refused to bring their children for baptism in the church uh, because, I mean, baptism at home was the norm. Um, and then uh, in 1835, uh, uh, again, uh, another traveller through Ireland, um, George Matheson, in his Journal of a Tour in Ireland, um, he talks about encountering a priest who baptises in, in his own house so that people would go to the priest's house and have, have their children baptized there. And uh, Matheson says, he says, he says, the priest baptizes at his own house and in a very slovenly manner. He said, I witnessed one baptism and the whole scene was so much the reverse of all that solemn sacramental rite ought to be. To shuffle over the prayers with railroad celerity seemed to be the priest's sole object. Um, now, Matheson uh, you know, Matheson is often critical of the priests and how they administer the sacraments. Having said that, I mean, he, he says in another place, after he went to hear a priest say mass in the chapel, and he was very 
unimpressed by how the priest uh, actually made his way through the liturgy. But then afterwards, he went in to the room, to the side room, to the chapel, and he saw the priest on his knees praying fervently for his people. And then it, uh, his heart, I suppose, changed because he said, OK, this guy mightn't be the, you know, the most liturgically adept of, uh, of priests, you know, but his heart is sort of literally in the right place um, that, 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 that he is a man of faith. Mother Mountain, the title of this series, comes from a very important spiritual site for the communities of Western Tipperary. I wanted to get a better understanding of local celebrations, such as the events to celebrate the Feast of the Assumption at Mother Mountain or Pattern Days that took place in similar locations. In his answer here, Salvador also touches on the subject of Holy Wells, which featured in episode one. Okay, a a, a Pattern Day. Well, first of all, I mean, Pattern Days were local celebrations of saints, for instance, uh, the Feast Days of Saints. And, And... celebrated at traditional pilgrimage sites. Uh, they're known as patterns because they, they, they come from the Irish patron, meaning patron, patron saint. Uh, oftentimes they were, they, they, they were conducted around wells, holy wells. Um, we, have, we have roughly about 3,000 holy wells, it's estimated, dotted across the country. And these pattern celebrations were dedicated, these holy wells, obviously are dedicated to specific saints and the pattern days were celebrating the, the, the feast days of these saints. People would come to these sites such as Holy Wells and they would perform a number of traditional rituals. Um, these would often involve the performance of what are called perambulations. Basically, uh, it's called in Irish a thrust or thrust, uh, going round, doing the rounds, often in, in one's bare feet, uh, doing the rounds of the well, they, people would recite uh, the Our Father, the Hail Mary and Glory Be, and, and, and recite these over and over again. They might recite decades of the rosary. They would mark off the decades sometimes by dropping a pebble after each decade if they didn't have rosary beads. Uh, they would then drink from the well itself. They would ask for healing. Um, the Holy Wells were renowned uh, for the healing of various ailments. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the healing of headache or toothache or warts, people who had difficulty walking, loss of sight and so on. And before pilgrims would leave the site, they would leave behind them a vote of offering. They might leave behind them a, a ribbon or a strip of cloth or rag, or they might leave a hairpin. They might leave the rosary beads or a holy picture or an item of clothing. Uh, these might be hung on a sacred bush or a, a tree flanking the well. Of course, you can see many of these uh, to this day, these sacred trees uh, with ribbons on them uh, in, in Holy Well sites. Now, Pattern Days were not, quote unquote, official religious celebrations. And I asked Salvador how they fitted into wider Catholic teachings and beliefs. Practices at Pattern Days um, didn't always go down well with, uh, with the church hierarchy. And oftentimes for various reasons uh, over time. So for instance, take one example, one early example in in, uh, 1761, Bishop Thomas Burke of Ossery instructed that alms were not to be given to beggars at the site of St. John's Well in Kilkenny because around the pattern days, they they turned up in swarms. Uh, Many of them pretended to be lame. And this gave rise, as he said, to mobbing rioting, cursing, swearing, thieving, excessive drinking, and other great debaucheries. Um, Ecclesiastical authorities, church authorities in the 18th and 19th centuries would routinely express grave concerns about people's behaviour on such uh, uh, occasions, because once these traditional religious and devotional rituals had finished around midnight, they were often supplanted by I suppose, what you might call a carnivalesque atmosphere. There would be music, revelry, heavy drinking, sexual uh, licentiousness, and even at times serious violence. Um, But also, um, it wasn't just the the social disorder that that, uh, church authorities would point to, but they would also be worried about aspects of, of, uh, of superstition. So priests would often instruct parishioners not to leave any beads or relics or medals at the well as, as, as votive offerings. 
but to have faith simply in their prayers and to bring the holy water from the well home with them. Again, uh, a traveller to Ireland in 1835, George Matheson, records how a woman went to a local holy well to have her bad eyesight cured, uh, while he says her superstition was left unchallenged by the priest, who just shrugged his shoulders when Matheson asked if she would not instead, you know, ask God to bless the doctor's prescription. And Matheson then remarked, because he said, you know, this, this priest isn't really correcting her as he should. And Matheson says, you know, the old women teach the children and the priests hold their tongues. So you, you had a variety of responses. So some priests uh, and, and church uh, members of the church hierarchy would try to instruct people or try to quash some of the more superstitious elements. And others would just throw their hands in the air and say, there's nothing much we can do about this. There's a lovely story, in fact, from the mid 1850s about a mother who wasn't able to read or write. Uh, and she asked someone to write a letter for her and because she wanted to send this letter to her son and her son was fighting with British forces in the Crimea. And she enclosed in the letter some stones from a local well for his protection. And she said to put in the letter, she said, tell my son, tell him that if he'll receive them and wear them in this purse around his neck with the same faith that his own mother is sending him, please God that he'll come home back safe and sound. Now, the letter writer, interestingly, almost sort of challenged her on this. And the letter writer said to her, he said, uh, you know, I'll bet my life, he says, Father Mick won't let you send the stones nor go to the well at all at all. To which the woman replied, Deaton, Father Mick knows I gave rounds at the well for him and I sent him the lining of the well in a letter and he didn't say ill you did it to me when I told him. So basically she was confident that Father Mick, the local church authority uh, in the region, that, that he would understand what she had done because hadn't she done the same for him. Salpur now explains how they went into decline in the years before the famine. So, for instance, when we're talking about the patterns and, uh, you know, uh, devotions at Holy Well, in, in many ways, the pattern days um, and the, the, the celebration of pattern days, a lot of the problems that were being pointed out by the church about those pattern days, they were actually almost coming to an end, even on the eve of the famine, even as early as the eve of the famine, that the heyday of the pattern days had really, had really gone. Uh, which is interesting. Um, but one of the things, of course, that we see in more recent times is, is a revival of interest in visits to Holy Wells, uh, and particularly at a time, of course, when, when, um, when church observance um, in terms of church attendance figures are obviously plummeting, but you have this revival of, of, of interest in Holy Wells and visiting Holy Wells and the observance of patterns. Uh, it's interesting that in, uh, one man who was interviewed in 2015 uh, and he was interviewed about his local pattern day, and he had this, he had the following to say about the continued adherence to rituals surrounding holy wells. So he was asked about, you know, why these continue to be so popular, and this is what he said. He said, well, of course, he says, you know, the wells, he says, go back 10,000 years. The mass only goes back about 2,000. Tis a, tis a modern innovation, you know, he says, God forgive me for saying it. He says, a modern innovation. So <laughs> I think that really captures something, at least about the perception of these holy sites in the landscape uh, and, and how far they go back, certainly about people's perception. The landscape was obviously very important in the pre-famine church. I was really curious about this, and Salvador now explains how some of this was just practical. You know, in various, in, in some regions of the country, um, well into the mid 19th century, uh, in some remote regions of the country, up in uh, up in the northwest, even you had you had people who were still actually uh, going to celebrate mass at mass rocks, and that wasn't because people were being persecuted, or it wasn't even out of a sense of um, sentimentality towards uh, toward, towards mass rocks and an attachment to mass rocks. It was just a very practical thing uh, that, that mass was oftentimes celebrated in, 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 uh, um, outdoors because there simply wasn't a suitable chapel available nearby. 
Uh, and this is all about, again, church infrastructure and, and, and the building of chapels. Yes, for, you know, a, a, for a, a quite considerable length of time, the church infra infrastructure in Ireland just simply wasn't in the building's in infrastructure. So this became a necessity and people became used to, to uh, religious practice outdoors and um, not, not, not only, you know, at places like Mass Rocks, uh, but also in, in, uh, at sacred sites in, in, in the landscape. Now contrast that, I think, with, we say, this push to move everything more into a church setting. So for instance, in the, in the 1830s, the Catholic Penny Magazine published 12 regulations for conduct in the house of God. And th these were to be read by both priests and people. And the emphasis, of course, was on propriety, civility, proper dress, and proper forms of behavior. So among the things that it, it stated, it said, you know, persons should avoid, if at all possible, coughing, spitting, and all ma manners of noise within the chapel. People should be remarkably clean in their dress. They should appear in a respectful posture. They should avoid any ridiculous gestures or forms. So by contrast, we'll say this was the world of the chapel, a world of increasing restraint and clerical supervision. At least in principle, it didn't allow the exercise of, we say, pious devotions in a myriad of different ways that you might see at a holy well or around a sacred tree or some other sacred site in the landscape where it was less supervised, where people were freer in a way to do their own thing. While these gatherings might be criticized by church authorities, uh, there was less clerical supervision than you would have within a chapel setting. Um, so be be before the proliferation of chapels, I suppose Irish Catholics made the landscape and its sacred sites part and parcel of religious life and their daily observance. Uh, and these sites, I suppose, as we talked about, they blended religious devotion and also entertainment. Uh, if you think of things like, you know, wakes and funerals, you know, these pattern days, even celebration of marriages and so on, these occasions had multiple purposes. Um, and they can't so easily be neatly divided into the sacred and the profane. Um, and of course, this continued to a certain extent, even after the building of chapels, uh, where chapels were used for all manner of purposes. Um, and in a way, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's a kind of a throwback to how churches were used, for instance, in the Middle Ages, because churches were not just for worship. You had all sorts of things that happened in churches because they were a local building. Uh, churches was a, were a local building that was there that could house, you know, a, a number of people that was dry, that was warm. They, they're, they're community spaces, if you like. And th th this use of chapels as community spaces would continue even into the late 19th century. Uh, so there is an uneasy transition from sort of um, regi religious life in the, in the landscape and then shifting into a chapel where you're supposed to be a lot more formal and, and a lot more proper, it doesn't always work that way. Um, these chapels often remain centres of entertainment, tradition and community building. To get a better sense of the pre-famine church, I asked Salvador if a famine emigrant had returned, would they notice a difference between the pre- and post-famine Catholic church? In terms of the, the vast changes that occurred in Irish Catholicism, uh, from around the middle of the 19th century onwards. This was Emmett Larkin's famous devotional revolution thesis, uh, which has been sort of modified since he originally published it in 1972. Um, so certainly there were vast changes that took place in Irish Catholicism over that period. I think modern historians would, uh, I mean, Emmett Larkin, um, put a lot of emphasis on the figure of, of uh, Archbishop Paul Cullen and we'll say the Synod of Perlis in 1850, but the, the figure of Cullen himself. Um, I think more recent historians are anxious to say, look, it didn't all start with Cullen, that many of the trends that you see um, in the later 19th century in terms of church reform had already started. We say in places like, like Dublin, 
under James Murray, Archbishop James Murray, in places like Kildare and Lachlan, um, under, on, under Bishop James Dial, uh, at a much earlier stage. So these tr trends were already there. But they would. It's Colin is given the lion's share of the, of of the uh, credit for it. He calls the Synod of Thurles, uh, 1850. It'll be the first national synod in Ireland since the 17th century. His vision really was the reappropriation of space, uh, the encouragement of church building to wean people away from domestic religious practice, and to reverse the worrying trend. Um, of traditional religion outside of church settings beyond the supervision of the clergy. So he would impose stricter clerical discipline. He would promote, for instance, parish missions and retreats. Uh, he would promote a wealth of devotions, often described as Roman devotions, but also Anglicized devotions. Um, promote the, you know, uh, the dissemination of popular religious literature, prayer books, uh, the dissemination of, of sacramentals, uh, such as, you know, uh, rosary beads, such as, you know, sacred heart images and all of these sort of things, um, scapulars and so on, popular prayer books. Um, the synod rule of Thurlis ruled that administration of the sacrament should take place in churches, not private houses. Um, now, there was some resistance, of course, to this, uh, to outlawing the celebration of sacraments at home. Uh, one person who, who could see this was actually Archbishop Slattery of Cashel, um, in whose diocese, obviously, it's in the Thurlis took place. He wasn't in favour of the complete uh, banning of this practice. And in fact, Paul Cullen became frustrated with Slattery. He said in one letter, he said he's the only all, or almost the only bishop who has done nothing about what was prescribed in the Synod of Thurlis. He says bat baptisms and confessions remain as they formerly were. They also celebrate marriages in private houses. So, so in some regions, uh, reform was, 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 was slow. We, we've talked about station masses, for instance. Um, station masses were subject to special scrutiny. Um, there, there, there were problems, for instance, uh, the church hierarchy had problems with the hearing of confessions of men and women without the use of a confessional. Uh, but of course, that wasn't all, you know, if you're hearing these in people's houses, that's not very practical. Uh, the Synod was gravely concerned about the hearing of women's confessions in private houses, uh, saying that confessions should be heard in churches and they should be heard in, 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 in uh, confessionals. Um, and it's interesting, uh, Rome actually re requested at one stage that if it was absolutely necessary to hear the confessions of women and men in, in private houses, that a fairly bulkable or a fairly bulky uh, portable screen should be actually carried, physically carried to these houses. And Colin, Archbishop Colin was, was tasked with selling the idea. It didn't go down too well in a lot of locations. I mean, I know the Bishop of Kerry, David Moriarty, when he presented the idea to his priests, they, he got some choice answers or comments about the prospect of, you know, hauling bulky confessional screens to some of the areas that they had to routinely visit in very remote and rural areas for, for station masses. There was also a clampdown on, 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 one of the reasons for the clampdown on private masses in, in private houses was around abuses associated with the practice, such as clergy seeking large, you know, offerings of money, for instance, they could receive as much as 40 pounds in a single collection. Um, also, the perception of the clergy and the, the, uh, how the clergy actually behave, the lives and the conduct of priests would come on under increasing scrutiny um, uh, with the Synod of Thurlis. For instance, it was said clergy should avoid secular company. They should avoid intemperance, public dances, race meetings, avoid card playing in public theatres. They should preserve their chastity. No parish priest was allowed to hold more than 15 acres and curates were forbidden to hold any land whatsoever. And I suppose this was to counteract the tendency among many Irish priests to double job as farmers because they could get a considerable amount of money from double jobbing. And also priests were ordered to wear clerical collars. They were to distinguish themselves from their parishioners. So you almost get this move towards a greater professionalization of, um, of the clergy. Um, 
so 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 these things, you know, these the, these are are some of the things that that uh, someone coming back would have noticed in terms of a, a, a different attitude among among the clergy, how the clergy were dressed. Uh, again, these things took time to implement, obviously. Mm. And then the proliferation of Catholic material culture. Uh, so there are more prayer books, uh, popular prayer books circulated. There are more religious medals, more scapulars. And, and these things, of course, are, are often sold um, at parish missions. The parish mission movement uh, that started in the, in the early 1840s, for instance, was hugely, um, was, was hugely instrumental in, in, in changing the, the, the face of Irish Catholicism. These parish missions went around nearly every parish in the country. And with them, you had these hawkers outside selling religious goods. Also at parish missions, for instance, you had people maybe receiving the sacraments who hadn't re received the sacraments for years or maybe not at all. So for instance, there's a famous one in, um, in Dingle in 1846, where there's a parish mission, in the, a redemptorist parish mission in, in, in Dingle, and so many people thronged to the parish mission to receive the sacrament of confirmation. It was about a thousand people who thronged to receive confirmation. And these weren't all youngsters. Many of them were older people. I mean, people were receiving confirmation into their 70s and 80s who'd never received it. And they thronged into the, to the church there. And they all pressed forward towards the, the altar, so much so that uh, it, 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 was, it was turning quite dangerous. And members of the local confraternity had to actually beat them back with sticks and clubs. And actually, you know, it became a bloody mess. I mean, people were actually really injured. There was, there was blood flowing in the chapel. Uh, and then they got confirmed. So, I mean, that was that, that was memorable. Listening to Salvador talk about the changes as the church moved indoor and the idea of civilising people reminded me of some of my research I had done around the Anglesey Road and when they were built through the mountains, the British authorities believed they were civilising those communities. So I asked Salvador, was what was happening in the church similar to this? Yeah, I think... No, I, I, I think you would really have to, to link both of them. So this, this idea of, you know, civilizing people, this idea of um, uh, instructing people on how to behave properly, this sort of um, thrust towards uh, greater moral living, for instance. And of course, later on, that, 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 that's tied very much into, into a whole Victorian attitude towards, for instance, even sexual morality. And you can't separate that from also what's, what's going on in terms of, of um, uh, uh, the Catholic Church and church reform. I mean, one of the things that, um, was one of the things that, that, that happens in local parishes is, is, is people being denounced from the altars, um, oftentimes indiscriminately by individual uh, priests. Uh, you could have, you know, a young couple who, you know, um, had a sexual relationship outside of marriage or whatever, and they're hauled into the chapel and then they have to kneel down and confess their sin in front of all the congregation. I mean, that could be done at a local level and insisted upon by a local priest. He would denounce them from the altar. And it, 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 it uh, became... I suppose it became such an issue, it, it, it ended up creating a lot more disorder than order, so much so that um, I think it was the Synod of Thurlis or shortly afterwards that actually being denounced from the altar in such a way um, was reserved only to the bishop or those who had the bishop or the, 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 um, the, 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 the bishop's express permission to do so um okay. so 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 the, the the you know individual priests were if they did it without the permission of the bishop they could be hauled over the coals for it uh, because it was seen as actually creating more social disorder than actually oh, fixing oh. anything i'd like to thank salvador for his time it was a really illuminating interview the next episode is part two and that's entitled The Crime and as the name suggests we get right into the heart of the series in that episode. 
that's already available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or Acast Plus for supporters. You can find links in the show notes below if you want to listen to that right now. Until next time, Sloan. Sloan.